This is the Argument Ninja Podcast, episode 34. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is the Argument Ninja Podcast, and I am your host, Kevin Delaplante. I was an academic philosopher for 20 years before leaving my tenure job so that I could devote myself full time to creating resources like this one that help people to think more critically and independently about issues that matter to them and to equip people with the skills and knowledge that are necessary to develop as an independent critical thinker in a 21st century media environment that has become increasingly hostile to critical thinking. This episode is part one of what will be a multi-part series on understanding the root causes of social and political polarization. In 2018, I spent a lot of time thinking about the critical thinking challenges posed by increasing polarization between tribal identity groups. I created a set of videos that explored this topic, and in those videos, I argued that it's important to distinguish the role that our evolved tribal psychology plays in our judgments and our feelings about other groups from the phenomenon of polarization itself. There's a tendency among some writers on this topic to think that our tribal psychology is what explains the increasingly divisive polarization that we're seeing today. There is some truth to this. My last set of videos is exactly on this topic. But in general, I think it's a mistake to think this way. To think that our tribal psychology is the root cause of the divisive polarization that everyone is talking about. And it's a mistake that has important consequences for the project of depolarization, which is a term we're seeing more and more of these days. There are civic initiatives popping up all over the world, but especially in the United States, that have the goal of reversing this polarizing trend, of depolarizing our political and civic culture. To give just one example, there's an organization called Better Angels, which you can find at betterangels.org, which is described as, quote, a citizens organization uniting red and blue Americans in a working alliance to depolarize America, unquote. On this episode, I want to talk about these depolarizing initiatives and take a closer look at their fundamental assumptions about the root causes of increasing polarization. Because this has to be the first step. Diagnosis has to come before treatment. Unfortunately, I think a lot of these depolarizing initiatives come to the table with the treatment already in mind. And this has the effect, I will argue, of overly narrowing our thinking about the possible causes of social polarization. We are ready to prescribe a cure before we've properly understood the disease. This is the question that I want to explore in this series. What do we think are the root causes of the increasing division and polarization that we're observing in our civic culture? And how do our efforts at depolarizing society reflect this understanding of root causes? That'll be the focus of this episode. We'll call it part one. I'm going to talk about three depolarizing initiatives, Better Angels, All Sides, and Open Mind, which is Jonathan Haidt's online training program. In part two of this series, I'm going to look at some other theoretical approaches to understanding polarization, some that take a bigger picture approach than you typically find in the discussion around polarization. In part three, I'm going to step back and use this question as an opportunity to introduce some general critical thinking principles for thinking about complex social phenomena that I haven't talked about all that much on the podcast. The first is a set of principles for understanding complex social phenomena of any kind, of which social polarization is just one example. And the second is a set of principles for developing the kind of background knowledge that supports genuine critical thinking of any kind, and then extend that to critical thinking about a phenomenon like polarization. And here I'm going to borrow some language that is already in use in the decision science and critical thinking literature. I'm going to talk about mental models as tools for building this kind of knowledge, and specifically about the value of bringing multiple mental models to bear on our thinking about complex social problems, like social polarization. And then in part four of this series, I'm going to give a case study in the application of multiple mental models to another complex social phenomena that is relevant for big picture thinking about the causes of polarization. I'm talking about the historical rise, fall, and collapse of complex societies, 
the type of phenomena that figures like Jared Diamond, Joseph Tainter, and Peter Turchin have written extensively about. Each of these figures has a theoretical framework for understanding the root causes of social collapse, but they're very different frameworks, as we'll see. Then, in part five, I'm going to change this scale again and go small and look at theoretical approaches to polarization that zero in on how ideas interact with technology and social dynamics. So at the end of this series, you and I will both have an understanding of the nature of polarization and the challenge of depolarization that is broader, deeper, and more nuanced than just about anything you will encounter in any single book or article, or within the scope of any single academic discipline. Now, one of my motivations for dedicating this much time on the podcast to this topic is that when this is done, I'll basically have the raw materials to complete a video course on the topic of critical thinking, tribalism, and polarization, which I can add to my catalog of tutorial courses. But I also feel some genuine urgency with this topic, because if we get the diagnosis wrong by framing the causes of polarization too narrowly, then we risk investing a lot of time and resources on depolarizing interventions that may not be as effective as they could be if they were part of a strategy that reflects a broader understanding of the root causes of the problem. And my hope is that this series will help to get people thinking and talking about this issue in a way that I just don't see happening right now. So with that introduction out of the way, let's get into it. Before we do anything else, I think we need to be clear about what people are talking about when they talk about increasing polarization or a crisis of polarization. Because sometimes this term is used simply to describe the negative rhetoric we see more and more of on TV and social media, the way partisan criticism has become more personal, more aggressive, more exaggerated over the past few years. And that's certainly part of it. But when social scientists talk about increasing trends in social polarization, they're usually talking about something both more specific and more general than this. Polarization is a measure of how different people are in various respects. When social scientists talk about increasing polarization, they're talking about trends in various empirical measures of polarization, primarily among American social groups that have been growing for decades. And there are two measures of polarization that we need to distinguish. The first is ideological polarization, and it measures how strongly people agree or disagree with various ideological or policy statements. Statements like, for example, government regulation of business usually does more harm than good, or the best way to ensure peace is through military strength. You ask people a bunch of these types of survey questions, and from their answers, you can compute how far apart members of different groups are on each issue and see how people differ by gender, by race, by age, by education level, by religious attendance, by political party affiliation, and so on. If you plot these survey results over the past 40 years, you see that ideological polarization for most groups has been pretty stable. For example, men and women typically do show some degree of polarization on these issues. But that difference hasn't changed much over the past few decades. But there are two trend lines that show a clear increase in ideological polarization. One is between people who attend religious services regularly and those who never attend religious services. Religious and secular groups have become increasingly polarized on political and social issues over the last few decades. Now the other trend line, which is much larger, and by far the largest predictor of ideological polarization in the U.S. context, is by party affiliation, people who identify as either Republican or Democrat. Republicans and Democrats, as a group, are much farther apart ideologically than they were 30 or 40 years ago. And most of this increase in distance has occurred since 2004, over the past 15 years. So that's one measure of social polarization. The other measure that social scientists are concerned with is what's known as affective polarization. Affect is the psychologist's term for feeling, how positively or negatively people feel about something. One way you can measure differences in how people feel about something is to give a list of groups and institutions and ask people to rate them on a scale from 0 to 100, 
where zero is defined as very cold or unfavorable, and 100 is defined as very warm or favorable. It's like asking to pick a temperature on a feeling thermometer that shows how strong your feelings are about something, either positively or negatively. So with this survey tool, you can measure how hot or cold different social groups are towards, say, Planned Parenthood, or Fox News, or the president, or Apple products, and so on. Now, the measure that is most concerning for us is how Democrats and Republicans feel about one another, what is known as partisan affective polarization. It's no surprise that Democrats and Republicans feel more warmly toward their own party and cooler toward the opposing party. That's expected. That's always been the case. Democrats and Republicans average between 70 and 75 degrees on the feeling thermometer scale for their own party. That's pretty favorable. What's striking, though, is how much cooler our feelings have become toward the opposing party over the years. From the 1970s to about 1990, the average temperatures toward the opposing party hovered in the 40s, quite a bit cooler than 70, but that average has since dropped sharply, hovering around the 10 degree mark. So Democrats and Republicans have become increasingly cold or hostile toward the other party since the 1990s. But it gets worse. This increase in hostility toward the other party is also bleeding into hostility toward members of the other party. Survey studies show, for example, that Americans today prefer to spend their social time with members of their own political party. They want their close friends to be members of their own party. They don't want to live next door to members of the opposing party. They don't want to marry or their kids to marry members of the opposing party. They're less likely to trust the advice of a medical doctor if they discover that the doctor is a member of the opposing party. When told that members of the opposing party live in their neighborhood, people express less satisfaction with living in that neighborhood, even if they don't know who these people are. People don't want their party leaders to compromise. They blame the other party for all the incivility we see in government. The majority of Democrats and Republicans will now say on surveys that they hold very unfavorable views of the people, not just candidates, in the opposing party. So the evidence seems to be clear. In recent decades, Americans really have become more distrustful and resentful of not just the opposing political party, but of the people who identify with the opposing party. These are the sorts of trends that people are really concerned with when they talk about a crisis of social polarization. And these are the sorts of trends that depolarization initiatives are trying to reverse. Now, with this under our belt, we can move on and talk about some of these depolarizing initiatives. And in particular, like I said, I'm interested in how these organizations understand the problem that we're describing here and what their strategy is for addressing this problem. I mentioned the Better Angels organization in the introduction, so let's start here. If you go to the Better Angels website, the banner headline reads, Polarization is tearing us apart. Better Angels is bringing us together. And here is their mission statement, quote, Better Angels is a citizens organization uniting red and blue Americans in a working alliance to depolarize America. We try to understand the other side's point of view, even if we don't agree with it. We engage those we disagree with, looking for common ground and ways to work together. We support principles that bring us together rather than divide us, unquote. Here's David Blankenhorn, one of the co-founders of Better Angels. Better Angels is a national grassroots citizens movement dedicated to three principles. Number one, the rancor, the divisiveness, the hatred of others who disagree with you, the hyperpartisanship is a trend that has gone way too far in this country and we need to put a stop to it right now. The second one, uh, is that despite our disagreements, our robust disagreements, and we're not trying to get people to change their minds here or uh, convert to the other party, but despite those disagreements, there is some common ground. And for our posterity and for our sake of our democracy, we need to find that common ground right now. The third principle is that we can create a space in our lives, in our society, beginning with us as individuals and the groups we're a part of and ultimately with our government, we can create a, a kind of 
depolarized zone, okay, where the divisiveness and rancor is outside that zone. We're operating within that zone in this different kind of way that is not, that is not so uh, polarized and, and filled with rancor. And that building that zone of depolarization is crucial for our country. And we need to do it right now. So what does Better Angels actually do? They help to organize what they call red-blue workshops, where they assemble five to seven right-leaning or Republican citizens, who are the Reds, and five to seven left-leaning or Democrat citizens, who are the Blues, for a day of structured, guided conversations that are led by moderators trained by Better Angels. So the total number in these workshops is usually between 10 and 15 people. Better Angels also offers skills workshops that teach people how to have respectful, productive conversations that, as they describe it, clarify differences, search for common ground, and affirm the importance of the relationship. They offer a standard skills workshop and two special skills workshops, one designed especially for reds and another designed for blues. These skills workshops can be larger, up to 50 people. Now, Better Angels does more than just run workshops. They sponsor a podcast, for example. But I want to focus on the workshops because that's the main component of their current depolarization strategy. Here's Bill Doherty, another co-founder, talking about what happens in these workshops. So what we've created with Better Angels is a, a, a container, a set of processes that uh, encourage people to listen deeply uh, to the opinions and the values and experiences of people on the other side of the chasm. And I learned something about you, and you return the favor to me. Um, and the core two questions there are, what values and beliefs does your side have that you think are good for the country? Values, policies, and beliefs, your side, good for the country. And then the second question, what reservations or concerns do you have about your own side? So in sum, we, we teach effective communication tools for communicating across political differences. And then we have people practice those skills and then talk about what went well with the practice, what were the challenges. And then people can go home and try these with their friends and family. So how do they envision that these workshops will bring about a less polarized society? Here's Bill Doherty again. I have seen people change in some powerful ways that affect them as they go out in their lives. And if we can spread that, if we can spread that far and wide, I believe in my heart that this can transform our country from the bottom up because I don't think it's going to get transformed from the top down anytime soon. I think this last bit is important. I'm interested in how depolarization strategies rely on or presuppose models of the root causes of polarization and models of how social change happens. The model of social change that is implicit in this approach is, as Bill Doherty says, a bottom-up approach. The solution focuses on changing the beliefs and attitudes of individual people how we see ourselves in relation to other people and other groups, how we view our responsibilities as citizens, and so on. Here's the diagnosis of the problem that is implicit in this depolarization strategy. The problem is that we have these distorted views of one another. We think we're more different than we really are. So the proposed solution is to bring people together, and through interaction and dialogue, we come to see one another as complex and fully human moral agents, and as having more in common than we thought. And this experience causes a reduction in our feelings of difference and otherness. We walk away feeling more connected to these people who we before viewed as more different, more alien to us. And then what? Well, the hope is that we bring these new attitudes and communication skills with us to our families and our communities, and through our interactions with other people, we grow a zone of depolarization that spreads outward and ultimately, as Bill Doherty hopes, transforms the country. Now, this is an example of what I call an individual level or person level model of depolarization. 
The target of change is the psychology of individual people. And the mechanism of social change is bottom-up, a program of consciousness raising and skill building that spreads from person to person. It's not targeting social structures or social institutions. It's targeting individuals. If there are broader political or social causes of polarization in play, this approach doesn't highlight those. Okay, I want to jump now to another depolarization initiative that has some similarities with Better Angels, but also has a different focus. The organization is called All Sides. The main site is at allsides.com. The concern here is the same. Our political and social culture is too polarized. It's not good for democracy. It's not good for society. It's not good for people. But the primary focus of All Sides is the effect that filter bubbles and the dynamics of media consumption in the digital age is having on us. The problem, as they see it, is that our media consumption is biased in a way that reinforces our respective political and ideological worldviews and drives us farther apart. Let me quote for you some language from the Allside website. Polarization is destroying us. Let's fix this. At all sides, we believe the way society gets its news and information affects the world around us, and lately it hasn't been going well. News, social media, and even search results have dramatically changed in the last several years, becoming so narrowly filtered, biased, and personalized that we are becoming less informed and less tolerant of different people and ideas. Blasted with the overwhelming 24-hour news noise of today, which is often loud, extreme, partisan, and rude, we tend to do one or both of the following. One, disengage from trying to understand or solve society's problems, and two, block out other perspectives, becoming more closed-minded and less tolerant of other people and ideas. But there is a better way. All Sides sees a strong connection between our ability to comprehend and tolerate different opinions and our ability to develop better schools, more jobs, more well-being, and less violence. So we decided to address the core problem, the overwhelming and often one-sided information flow. How? Change the way we get information so it is easy to sort through the noise and see different perspectives. Armed with a broader view, we can resist attempts to manipulate us in one direction or the other. Instead, we can truly decide for ourselves. So what does All Sides actually do? Here's another quote. We're creating a better informed, less polarized world. All Sides delivers technology and services to provide multiple perspectives on news, issues, and topics, and the people behind the ideas. With it, we get a broader, deeper understanding of the issues and each other. So together, we can build a more perfect union. End quote. And this is what you see when you visit the All Sides website. It's basically a news service provider reporting and aggregating information sources on the news of the day that provides a balance of viewpoints. So you can see right up front how right-leaning sources, left-leaning sources, and center-leaning sources are talking about a given topic or issue because they're labeled as such right there on the page. Now, I want to note, All Sides doesn't just do news coverage. There's a satellite organization called All Sides for Schools that provides resources for teachers and educators. Here's some language from this site. How can teachers prepare students with the skills and knowledge they need to navigate modern media, social networks, and their personal relationships? How can teachers engage in current events and controversial topics without causing divisions in the classroom or being charged with bias? All Sides for Schools helps educators teach essential skills in critical thinking, collaboration, listening and respectful discourse, media literacy, and social-emotional learning. Our unique focus on building relationships and revealing multiple viewpoints across the political spectrum avoids the potential problems with bias and disrespecting individual beliefs. So, All Sides for Schools also promotes education in the kind of respectful conversation and dialogue skills that would likely be taught in a Better Angels Skills Workshop. And there's more. All Sides is also affiliated with an organization that facilitates community conversations similar to those run by Better Angels. This organization is called Living Room Conversations. 
The organization brings together small groups of people from differing political and ideological orientations to have respectful, productive conversations that, it's hoped, will increase understanding and decrease polarization. So there's a lot of ideological and strategic overlap between this set of linked organizations associated with all sides and an organization like Better Angels. But the differences are important. All Sides has a particular focus on the polarizing effect of filter bubbles and media bias, which isn't front and center in the Better Angels analysis of polarization. Part of the goal of the All Sides educational initiative is to teach students the media literacy skills that can help young people become aware of these polarizing effects and teach them how to take control of their media consumption habits. Now, what can we say about the underlying diagnosis and solution that All Sides provides? The model of polarization that AllSides.com endorses is one that locates the source of social polarization in our polarized media environment, which is aggravated by modern digital technologies. So for them, the solution can't be just about raising the consciousness of individuals to the problem. The target of the diagnosis is a higher level social structure. The digital media environment that exploits and reinforces polarization and that feeds us a narrow, one-sided stream of information that distorts our perception of the world. And there isn't a comparable focus in the Better Angels model of polarization. Now, let's move on to a third different polarization initiative, which again has some overlap with the programs we've been talking about, but also adds its own distinctive point of view. This is one that some of my audience will be familiar with. When Jonathan Haidt published his book, The Righteous Mind, in 2012, he was motivated in part by the growing polarization that he saw between liberals and conservatives in the United States and wanting to understand this phenomenon. The full title of the book is The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. One can read it as a psychological diagnosis of polarization, with a focus on differences between liberals and conservatives at the level of underlying moral psychology. Now, Haidt has a more recent book out, co-written with Greg Lukianoff, called The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. This book is about the emotional well-being of college-age students today and their feeling that institutions need to protect them from words and ideas they don't like. Now, the book isn't about social polarization per se, but they do argue that this trend among young people has a side effect of aggravating and feeding into polarization between the left and the right. And they lay out this case in chapter six, which is titled The Polarization Cycle. I'll say more about this, but the point I'm getting to is that Jonathan Haidt has spearheaded the development of a depolarization initiative in the form of an online self-help resource called Open Mind, which is described as, and I quote, a free interactive platform designed to depolarize communities and foster mutual understanding across differences. Here's more from the Open Mind homepage. Open Mind is a psychology-based educational platform designed to depolarize campuses, companies, organizations, and communities. Open Mind helps people foster intellectual humility and mutual understanding while equipping them with the essential cognitive skills to engage constructively across differences. Open Mind equips people with the knowledge and skills to understand the perspectives of others, learn and grow from challenging conversations, reach mutual understanding, reduce hostility and distrust, speak constructively across differences, and cultivate civic virtues. So basically, Open Mind is an online learning program that teaches a collection of ideas and skills from psychology and psychotherapy that will be familiar to anyone who has read The Righteous Mind and The Coddling of the American Mind. There are five units in the curriculum, and they're titled The Benefits of Disagreement, Intellectual Humility, The Irrational Mind, The Moral Matrix, and Constructive Disagreement. I think the site wants us to think of this curriculum as the kind of depolarization skills training that Haidt would design, that he would run in person if he had the time, given his understanding of the causes of polarization. And this is the question that I'm interested in. What is the underlying conception of the root causes of social polarization that is implicit in this program for depolarizing society? 
Well, here's one way to think about it. Height's approach is also predominantly an individual level or person level approach to the extent that it focuses on the quirks of human moral psychology, how to manage conversations between individual people, and therapeutic interventions aimed at changing individual human responses and behaviors, like cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. This is all about helping individuals understand their own psychology and equipping them with tools for altering their behavior and for interacting more productively with other people. Now, in the Coddling of the American Mind book, Height does talk about the role of social factors in the rise of increased polarization. In this book, he's more concerned with trying to understand rising polarization on college campuses, but some of the social factors that he and Greg Lukianoff talk about apply to polarization more broadly. The argument they make, in fact, is that the specific kind of polarization that they see coming out of college campuses in recent years and broader trends toward increasing political polarization within society are dynamically connected. Part of the aim of the book is to shine light on these relationships. Here's a quote from chapter three. If we step back and look at American universities as complex institutions nested within a larger society that has been growing steadily more divided, angry, and polarized, we begin to see the left and the right locked into a game of mutual provocation and reciprocal outrage that is an essential piece of the puzzle we are trying to solve in this book. Now, I think it's interesting that open mind is as individual focused as it is, given how sensitive height is to the broader social forces that are driving polarization. Let's look at what height and Lukianov have to say about these broader social forces. There's quite a bit here, but it's all relevant to the topic, and it's important for the broader story that I want to tell that we get all of this out on the table. So, in Chapter 3, Haidt and Lukianov present four points that summarize a diverse body of research on the causes of polarization in the American context. And they're specifically interested in looking at factors that might help to explain the kind of trend data that I described earlier that shows a sharp increase in polarization starting around the mid-1990s. All right. First, they note that in the United States, the period from the 1940s to around 1980 was one of comparatively low political polarization and high levels of social trust and trust in government. This is due in part to the fact that the country as a whole faced a number of common challenges and enemies over this period, most notably the Great Depression, the threat of the Axis powers during World War II, and the threat of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. When social scientists talk about solutions to intergroup conflict, this is one of them. It really helps if you have what they call superordinate goals, shared goals that go beyond group boundaries and include all groups. Republicans and Democrats had to cooperate to face these challenges together. They had to see themselves as tribes within a larger national tribe that had common goals and shared a common fate. This common fate made us more internally cohesive and cooperative. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s, there was a period of several decades where the United States was the only global superpower. Loss of a common enemy removes these superordinate incentives to cooperate. And consequently, the argument goes, we see a steady rise in internal political polarization from this time onward. All right, that was the first factor. A second social factor that Haidt and Lukianov discuss, and that many political scientists have documented, is the increasing social segregation that has occurred in American society starting in the late 60s and continuing today. In earlier decades, the two major political parties were more demographically mixed. There were still differences. Back in 1972, Republicans were more conservative and Democrats were more liberal. Republicans were more white and Democrats were more black. In terms of religion, Republicans were more Protestant and Democrats were more Catholic. But there were just as many churchgoers in both parties. And these differences were far less pronounced then than they are now. Over the next three decades, the parties sorted themselves along racial, religious, and other demographic lines. The Republican Party became the party of conservative white Christians dominating rural areas in the South. The Democratic Party became the party of urban liberal secularists and racial minorities. 
This demographic shift is sometimes called the big sort, after a 2008 book title by journalist Bill Bishop. The full title is The Big Sort, where the clustering of like-minded Americans is tearing us apart. Now, how does this social sorting contribute to social polarization? The idea is that sorting of this kind makes it less and less likely over time that we will encounter people in our daily lives who are different from us. When we were more mixed, we were members of more cross-cutting social identities. This realignment of cross-cutting social groups into two relatively homogeneous megagroups has the effect that, over time, liberals will tend to live and work with other liberals, and conservatives will tend to live and work with other conservatives. This segregation makes it harder for us to empathize with or relate to the experiences and perspectives of people outside our social group. Haidt and Lukianoff only devote a couple of paragraphs to social sorting, but I think this is an important point to appreciate. It can be surprising to learn just how culturally segregated our political identity groups have become. Liliana Mason documents these trends in her recent book, Uncivil Agreement. It's quite an eye-opener. For example, today, in the United States, if you're liberal, secular, urban, low-income, and Hispanic or Black, it's very likely you're a Democrat. If you're conservative, church-going, rural, middle class or wealthy and white, you're very likely a Republican. But not only that, Democrats and Republicans shop at different grocery stores. They drive different kinds of cars. If you drive a hybrid, you're probably a Democrat. If you drive a Jaguar, you're probably a Republican. Republicans drink Sam Adams. Democrats drink Heineken. Republicans drink Dr. Pepper. Democrats drink 7-Up. Republicans watch golf and NASCAR. Democrats watch tennis and basketball. Today, Republicans and Democrats live and work in different environments and participate in different cultural activities. And when they are forced to mix, like at work or at school, they have a hard time talking to one another. Their cultural differences are a barrier to communication. They don't feel comfortable mixing. They look for opportunities to self-segregate. So this discussion is still all part of the second factor that Haidt and Lukianoff believe helps to explain trends in social polarization. This explanation combines two factors. One, an empirical claim about a demographic shift that has segregated American society into two large social groups defined primarily by their political identity. And two, a psychological claim about the role that exposure to different types of people plays in creating empathy and a sense of shared moral identity. Social isolation reduces empathy and makes it easier to view people in the other group as not belonging to our moral community, and therefore not entitled to the respect and dignity that we show to our own. All right, that was number two. Let's move on and talk about Haidt and Lukianov's third trend, third explanatory factor for understanding increasing social polarization. This one is about changes in our media environment, and it echoes some of the concerns of an organization like All Sides. It used to be the case that everyone listened to the same radio programs and watched the same television stations. With the rise of cable news, there are now dedicated channels that cater to the political preferences of different audiences. And the rise of internet and social media culture has allowed for the creation of new kinds of filter bubbles and echo chambers that consolidate and isolate tribal groups and magnify hostile rhetoric directed towards other groups. Now, this, of course, is a global phenomenon driven by the evolution of corporate tech company revenue models. It's not an American phenomenon, per se, though American companies have been the primary instrument and instigator of these social changes. And finally, Haidt and Lukianoff discuss a fourth factor, a fourth trend in American politics, the trend toward, quote, increasingly bitter hostility in Congress. So this is specifically about changes in the way that Congress is run and the culture of civility and cooperation within Congress over the time period where polarization sharply increased. They describe how, in 1994, Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House of Representatives, leading a Republican Congress while Democrat Bill Clinton was president. Gingrich imposed a set of reforms that, according to Haidt and Lukianoff, quote, was intended to discourage his many new Republican members of Congress from forging the sort of personal relationships across party lines 
that had been normal in previous decades, unquote. For example, he changed the work schedule so that all business was done midweek, and then he encouraged his members not to move to Washington, but to remain living in their home districts and fly to Washington for a few days each week instead. So this gave these Republican members of Congress less time and opportunity to socialize with members of the opposing party. These changes were introduced as a strategy for nurturing a more cohesive and combative Republican team. I'll quote from the book here. The more combative norms then filtered up to the Senate as well, though in a weaker form. With control shifting back and forth several times since 1995, and with so much at stake with each shift, norms of civility and possibilities for bipartisanship have nearly disappeared. As political scientists Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt put it, quote, Parties have come to view each other not as legitimate rivals, but as dangerous enemies. Losing ceases to be an accepted part of the political process and instead becomes a catastrophe, unquote. So, according to Haidt and Lukianov, these four trends, not just these four, but predominantly these four, the lack of a common threat or challenge to bind us together, the effects of social segregation, the rise of partisan and polarizing media, and the erosion of norms of civility and cooperation in government, have all contributed to the rise of an extreme form of political polarization in America that is characterized first and foremost by hostility toward the opposing party and members of that party, or what social scientists call negative partisanship. If you think by analogy with fan attitudes toward sports teams, positive partisanship is like showing enthusiastic support for your team. You're rooting for your team to win. That doesn't mean you have to hate the other team. You can well admire the other team. You just favor your team. Negative partisanship is like rooting for the other team to lose because you dislike them. Whether your team is the most worthy or deserving isn't as important as your hostility toward the other team. What matters most to you is that they not win. That's negative partisanship. In other words, American politics has become a tribal politics of us versus them, where the primary goal is to stop them from gaining power, stop them from achieving their political goals. Better that no one win than they win. Now, this is quite an indictment, but there's a large body of empirical research to back it up. I recommend Liliana Mason's book on civil agreement if you want really thorough documentation on this. Now, before I move on, I want to add that this list of four trends was just part of a longer list that Jonathan Haidt and Sam Abrams presented in a Washington Post article back in 2015 titled, The Top 10 Reasons American Politics Are So Broken. In that article, they also mention the effects of increasing levels of education. Educated people tend to be more partisan. Increasing levels of immigration and diversity, leading to larger racial and ethnic divisions and the increasing role of money in politics. Politicians are afraid to offend their party's donors. So, from all of this, we know that the story that Jonathan Haidt would tell of the root causes of political and social polarization is a complex one. The basic empirical story can be told in terms of these converging demographic and social and technological trend lines. The causal story is more obscure. It can be hard to tell what is cause and what is effect and these intersecting trend histories. But what's clear is that polarization is a multifactorial phenomenon. There are many different types of causal factors that contribute to it. Demographic changes are different from changes in media and information technology, and both of these are different from changes in norms of civility and cooperation. They interact, but they're not the same thing. And these different causal factors are multiscalar, They operate at different levels in the social hierarchy. Some operate globally. Others operate nationally and regionally. Some operate on very short time scales, like the 24-hour news cycle. And some operate on longer time scales, like social segregation, which is on a scale of decades. Some of these factors are under the control of identifiable people and groups, like the rules for how Congress works, or the editorial staff of news organizations, or the business decisions of technology companies. And some of these factors are largely outside of anyone's individual control, like demographic shifts caused by immigration and aging populations. 
or the general evolution of information technologies, or the way that our brains are hardwired for tribal thinking. So, given all this, let's return to OpenMind, the online learning platform that is based on Height's work and that is designed to address the problem of polarization. What stands out for me is how narrow the framing of the solution is compared to this diagnosis of the nature of the problem. As I said earlier, as a depolarizing tool, Open Mind is focused on changing individuals. It educates people about how the human mind works, how we can better understand how other people can hold views that seem so different from ours, how to have productive conversations with these people, and how to gain more control over our own responses and behaviors. There's nothing in the program that educates people about these broader social factors that are driving polarization. Or if there is, it's clearly not the main focus of the program. The main focus is changing how individuals think and respond. So this is my first observation about the depolarizing initiatives that we've looked at so far. The solutions that they offer target individuals. If we can change individual people and how they interact with other individual people, we can change society. This is explicit with better angels and open mind. All Sides has a different emphasis in that it's concerned about biased news media consumption, and it provides a platform where people can go to get a more balanced presentation of the news. But the emphasis is still on individuals developing awareness of the distorting effects of media bias and on developing new media consumption habits. In this respect, it's analogous to public health campaigns that educate people about how unhealthy the average person's diet is and teach them how to make better food choices. Now, I have no problem with educating individuals, but what I'm struck by is the conviction that these depolarizing initiatives express in their press releases and in their website copy that we can effectively depolarize society by changing one person at a time. And it's not just that I'm skeptical of this bottom-up approach. Their own analyses of the problem undermine this conviction. The problem is most obvious with open mind when you know that Jonathan Haidt and his colleagues have a much more sophisticated diagnosis of the causes of polarization. They know it's a complex, multifactorial, multiscalar social phenomenon. And yet, the open mind platform doesn't address any of these social factors. To me, the analogy would be like having a sophisticated social analysis of the causes of the obesity epidemic, and at the end of the day, your solution is just to educate people how to eat better. A solution that you have no reason to believe will actually solve the problem. Now, there's an obvious defense against this objection that these depolarizing initiatives could offer. They could say, yes, we appreciate that polarization is a complex phenomenon that involves a variety of social and technological factors that interact with individual psychological factors to generate the polarization that we're seeing today. But we have little or no control over these broader social and technological factors. We're very small fish in a big pond. We can't change how global capitalism and digital media are changing how we interact with technology. We can't change how American society has segregated itself over the past 40 years. We can't change how immigration is affecting attitudes within the popular culture. But we can help individual people to change how they think and how they relate to other people. That's something we can do with the limited resources we have. And we believe that individual change is a necessary part of any solution to the problem polarization. Now, this, at least, would be an honest statement, and I can imagine getting behind that. But this is not what these organizations are saying. So I think I'll stop here and call this the end, part one. My goals for this episode were to introduce the debate around the causes of polarization and to examine how three established depolarization initiatives are addressing the problem. I looked at Better Angels, All Sides, and Open Mind. Now, these aren't the only groups trying to address polarization. There are others, and we'll look at a couple more in part two. And what we'll find as we reflect on these examples is that each of these organizations either understands the causes of polarization in a different way or understands the challenge of depolarization in a different way. And these organizations may only have a slight awareness 
of how other groups may be understanding the problem differently. This is all going to be set up for the discussion I want to have in part three, which is about general critical thinking principles for understanding complex social phenomena like polarization. Because all these different perspectives and causal stories is exactly what we would predict to find from a complex systems perspective. But I'll hold off on that discussion for later. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you again soon.